Well, it is Palm Sunday of the year of our Lord, 2020. And uh, we are going to begin our walk through the uh, events of Holy Week of this year, but we're going to trace the events as they unfolded in the year of our Lord, 33, by my lights. And so that's what we're going to do today, uh, Sunday morning, we're, or Sunday, we're going to trace the events of Sunday. And uh, just day by day through the week, has, as those, un those events unfold, by my lights. And that's an important dynamic. And I want to take just a couple of minutes to talk about that because uh, there is really a twofold animating concern that, that has, it has motivated me to, to go to work on this. And, and it can be summed up in this phrase that the narrative we are considering, considering is real history. It's, it's a real drama. And by that, I mean that in the first place, it's a staggering drama. It, uh, and, and we need to trace it as a drama. And, and, and the intent is to follow it day by day as it moves toward this remarkable twofold climax, if you don't mind, the first on Friday and the greater one on, on Saturday. But, but the point is, it's a drama. And rather than just pondering it as individual events and so on, we really need to follow the flow and follow the rhythm and so on. So, so we're gonna work hard at that, but by the same token, it's a real drama That's his, it is, it, that is, it is real history. And it is history which is recorded only really authoritatively, independently in four selective gospels. And it happened over 2000 years ago, this drama did which is simply to say that in the course of our consideration of this narrative, questions will arise. Sometimes there are attacks by skeptics and, and critics who challenge the, integri the integrity of the whole story, the accounts. Other times, uh, and, and really more of a concern for us, there are legitimate questions of detail and chronology and harmonization and uh, historical reconstruction and so on. And so in that regard, two comments. Number one, please understand that I have spent some years and they've been enjoyable years studying this series of events, but I'm just one voice. And given social media and the various uh, venues that are, and I'm making use of one of those venues. But what you need to understand is I'm an interloper in your life and mine. There are those in your family, there are those in your church, your pastor, and so on, even in your circle of friends, who quite frankly have more purchase on, on your credulity than, than I do, who are, uh, it's fair to say, uh, more, they, they, they have, um, they're more legitimately qualified to speak into your life than I. So take these lessons has just one voice. I trust a helpful and credible voice to one degree or another, but where there is some question or debate, and I'm gonna to have to deal with some of those, but put Proverbs 18, 17 to work. I think it's 18, 17. The man who is first in his own cause seems just, but his neighbor comes and searches him. And the point is that here both sides of the questions and uh, weigh the credulity of every a source and or the credibility I should say of every source and listen best to those most worthy of, of your trust. The subject at hand is is certainly worthy of that kind of careful and measured study and scrutiny. So again, I, I we're going to trace the and I'm going to speak into those issues and so on along the way. But that's the other point to be made that this story is real history. And I want to trace the week as a drama, and I'm eager not to short circuit the telling of that drama by stopping over much to deal with the discussion of those issues, some of which are a little bit complicated. But on the other hand, those historical questions and so on that arise. But on the other hand, uh, I don't want to leave the impression either that those questions have no answer or that I haven't at least thought a little bit about the conclusions to which I've come, and which is going to be reflected in the telling of the drama that will unfold here in the next little while. So forgive the excursus here, but 
I'm going to use, there are in the course of the Passion Week, there are two week, two days that by my lights again are regarded as silent days, Wednesday and Saturday. That is the record jumps by my lights as I'll unfold from late Tuesday night until Thursday afternoon. So Wednesday is not much recorded. And then of course, from the burial of Jesus on Friday until Sunday morning. So Saturday is only briefly mentioned, but they, 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 those days are worthy of comment and I will. But I'm gonna take those days to, to uh, talk about some of these issues of, uh, uh, again, questions and debates. So that'll unfold as it will. So let me take you then to the story with that background. Uh, again, the, the, the plan is to meet at four o'clock today and then 10 o'clock each morning, Monday through Friday. And uh, some students said, well, then you'll have nothing to talk about on Wednesday, because I believe it is a silent Wednesday. Okay. But in point of fact, it seemed to me it might be a good time to sort of back up a little bit and deal with some questions like, on what day of the week did Jesus die? That's a very important question. And I'm teaching Friday, and I believe Friday, but I recognize that there are valid points to be made. And there are other positions, especially Thursday crucifixion, which is very common and people who believe the Bible as much as I do and are smarter than I believe in that. But I'll talk about some of those issues. But today, and then again on Easter Sunday, I plan to meet with you on Easter Sunday, but at four in the afternoon to try and avoid any conflict with church service and so on. But then uh, the rest of the week at 10 o'clock in the morning. Well, I am going to try, and this may be a little clunky, I'm telling you, this is, this is live in every way. But I want to take you to a PowerPoint. And I'm very much hoping that this PowerPoint uh, will work. But uh, let me, I need to take you to share that screen. And so now, this is the PowerPoint. I have it on my screen. I trust you, you have it on yours. Mine is not keeping up. But uh, check here, forgive all of that. All right. Well, let me. Uh, whoa, 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 whoa! I need to turn that off. All right. All right. So uh, again, Sunday. Now, this is the outline that we will use throughout the week, and uh, uh, today our focus is on Sunday, a day of messianic presentation. And again, this is just an easy way for me to follow the days and and. Uh, so Sunday, a day of messianic presentation in that this is the day of the triumphal entry. And the triumphal entry was, and, and, and this is where we are headed, and this is all important. Sunday was the most deliberate and dramatic moment of messianic presentation in Jesus' ministry. All throughout his ministry, he made the claim to be the Messiah. He was careful about it. He was wise as a serpent, even in the way he made the claim, but he openly, and he was recognized to be claiming to be the Messiah, uh, so long promised in the Hebrew scriptures. But uh, the one moment where he most dramatically makes that claim, and then on the following two days, he is going to prove the validity of that claim on Monday and Tuesday. But, but Sunday, the day before us, is a day of messianic presentation. Now, the, the, our last lesson, we talked about the trip that Jesus took to get to Jerusalem for this Passover. And I tried to make the point that this was not an accident, that Jesus, that is the triumphal entry itself, that Jesus, by reason of a uh, remarkably crafty, uh, clever strategy, alerted the city to his coming. And that's so much a part of what's going on here that I'm going to take the time to uh, review that very, very quickly. So here is a PowerPoint that, that seeks to do that. And I want to remind you, this is the lessons we've already been through, that several weeks earlier, Jesus had been in the land of Perea on the east side of the Jordan Rift. And there he had, uh, some Pharisees had come and insisted that, uh, and tried to, to lure him back into Jerusalem, uh, where they could do him harm. And Jesus 
had made a remarkable promise to those Pharisees. This is Luke 13 and verse 34, when he had said, verse 34 and 35, that in point of fact, I'm not going to fall for your little trick, and I'll only come in the Father's time, uh, in the Father's time. But know this, that you will not see me until you cry out, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And you'll recall, perhaps, that we made the point that that last phrase is out of Psalm 118, a Psalm of Messianic inauguration. And what Jesus is saying is, you're not going to receive me, Jerusalem, Pharisees who represent and really rule in Jerusalem. You're not going to see me until you welcome me as Messiah, until you cry out, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And I made the point that had you been there that day, you would have said, you know what, that's not going to happen. That's simply not going to happen. And yet it is about to happen. And I want to trace the steps which biblically, uh, we, we can trace the steps biblically by which Jesus caused it to happen. So first of all, we talked a little geography. I'm going to be quick here. Uh, and, and we made the point that after, all right, after that episode where he encountered the Pharisees in Perea, he tarried in Perea until he heard that Lazarus was sick. This is John 11. And then Jesus hastened, oh, he waited two days, and then he made his way over to Bethany, just on the east side of the city of Jerusalem, and he called Lazarus from the dead. Now, I made the point at that time. I'm not going to go there now. But in John 11, the John, after telling the story of the raising of Lazarus, is so explicit as to how that laid the, 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 the set the stage, or uh, that was preparatory to the, the Passion Week and specifically to the triumphal entry. So here's what John says. He says, number one in John 11, verse 57, and then, I'm sorry, verse 53, and then verse 57, he says that because of the raising of Lazarus, Jesus was a fugitive. He was a wanted man. There was a price on his head. For that reason, secondly, Jesus walked no more openly among the Jews, but he went to a little village called Ephraim, or Ephraim, which is just north of the city of Jerusalem and is on the border between Judea to the south and Samaria to the north. So Jesus is a fugitive. This is just weeks before the Passion. He's a fugitive. He is waiting, or he is hiding, and he is biding his time until the time comes for him to set out for Jerusalem. But he's waiting in a little village called Ephraim. That's where we're going to pick it up. Now, the other consequence that John is so careful to give us, and this is in verses uh, 55 and 56 of John 11, he says that, that the people who were coming up early to the city for rites of purification were, were, were asking one another, they were whispering to one another, and they were asking, do you think Jesus will even come to the feast? So the city is a Twitter with the question, is the Nazarene coming to the feast? And against that backdrop, let me pick it up, because we picked the story up here on our map, and Jesus is in Ephraim, and it's a little town just north of the city of Jerusalem, but I've highlighted it for you with a, with a marker. And uh, now here is the geographical background, and this is important, that uh, the, uh, the, the geographical regions involved, this may be new to some, very quick, Judea to the south, between the Dead Sea and the shore, the, the Mediterranean, Samaria to the north. And you remember that Samaritans uh, don't have anything to do. There is great antagonism, and it's dangerous for Judeans or for Jewish people to be found in, in Samaria. But then to the north of that is uh, Galilee. And uh, more Jews live in Galilee. Many times more Jews live in Galilee than uh, live in Judea. And, and Jesus is a Galilean. So the point is, and this is what we, the point that we made last week, that there are going to be literally tens and probably scores, hundreds of thousands in many cases of Jews coming down from Galilee to attend the Passover, especially this year. People are coming this year, John 12 says explicitly, just because they want to see Lazarus, who Jesus raised from the dead. So, so the city is always crowded. It's perhaps extra crowded this year. And there are two routes by which Jewish folk in Galilee might make their way down to Jerusalem. And that's our point here. The, uh, 
Galilee, of course, is that broader area, and it is on the southern, the southern, the southern portion of the, the of, of Lower Galilee is in in, in fact or of Galilee, the region of Galilee, is this valley called Jezreel, and uh, it's an arrowhead-shaped valley, and it has sort of a shaft on the arrow, which is the Valley Herod. All right, I'm losing you. So here's the point: the habits of the Jews was, and Jesus knew this. Was, the habit of the Jews was to, they would always travel to Passover in large bands of Passover pilgrims, because it was danger along the way with the men on the outside and the women and the children on the inn and so on the inside. And so they would gather in the Jezreel Valley, and now they had two choices, or there were two routes by which they might make their way down to Jerusalem for the Passover. And the one is what I've marked here, it's called the Ridge Route. It just makes its way right along the ridge. It's the fastest, it's the most direct but it's the one you would choose, but it passes right through Samaria, it's dangerous. And so in most cases, and certainly in this case, this year, 33 AD, they, they found it necessary to take the more difficult alternative route, which made its way down the Herod Valley and crossed the Jordan River because the border of Samaria on the east was the Jordan River. And then they would make their way down the rift, this deep rift uh, on the eastern side of the river, reford the river, at Jericho and make their way up to Jerusalem. Now, this was about twice a, a half again as long. It was much more difficult, but it avoided Samaria. We know that this is the route that they're taking in Jesus' day because this route goes through Jericho and Jesus is going to go through Jericho. So here is the point. Jesus, because he knows the habits of the Galilean Jews as to how they make their way down to Jerusalem, and because he is wise as a serpent and harmless as, as a dove, and because it's imperative that he get into Jerusalem, but he's a fugitive. There's a price on his head. How is he going to do it? He is at Ephraim. I go back to it. Now, curiously, this is where Luke picks up the story. Uh, Luke and John have been sort of tag te teaming. We went through this last week. And uh, the, the, the scriptures are explicit, Luke 17, 11, that as he went to Jerusalem, he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. And as I said, that's confusing to many because he seems to be going in the wrong direction. He seems to have Jerusalem in the rear view mirror, but there is design in this. There is genius in this because Jesus had worked so carefully to gain standing in Samaria. And so he could, and he did. We have it in John 7, Luke 19. We have it uh, in John chapter 4. Jesus uses his standing that he earned way back there in John chapter 4 uh, to, to, because he's not in danger. So uh, he is able to go even at the feast season through Samaria. And so here he goes. Jesus sets out. What does the Bible say? He passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. And he made his way up the ridge route because he's heading up to Galilee. And once he gets to Galilee, probably there in the Jezreel Valley, but he falls in with one of these bands of Passover pilgrims. And now he travels with them. And it's going to take him about five days same route down the Herod Valley, down the eastern side of the Jordan River, and then up the eastern slope of the Mount of Olives. But all along the way, he is teaching. He is doing miracles, 10 lepers, two blind men at Jericho. He is, uh, I like to say, uh, deliberately playing the provocateur is when he invites himself to lunch with a tax collector, which would have offended everybody in the crowd. So Jesus is making his way. And he's with one of these bands of Passover pilgrims. And it's going to be, like I say, five or six days of travel. Uh, it, it was probably growing as people heard and ran to join this and, and, and to hear the teaching of the, of the Nazarene and so on. But then John 12, and this is where it becomes very strategic to what we're saying, what we're, we're looking at. In John chapter 12, we're told that exactly six days before the Passover, now that's by my lights, again, and I can explain how I get here, it really is the prevailing opinion, though there is some discussion. But six days before the Passover, the Passover being Thursday, would be Friday, the former week. So on Friday, last Friday, here we are on Palm Sunday. So two days ago, if we transport ourselves back to 33 AD, Jesus had arrived in Bethany. But he had been traveling with hundreds of excited people who were anxious to get into the city of Jerusalem before the sun went down. And furthermore, we know because John tells us explicitly, John 11:55 55 and 56, that that city was abuzz with the question, 
is the Nazarene going to come to the feast? What do you think? There's a price on his head. The Jewish leadership is so upset with him. They're enraged with him. Do you think he'll even have the nerve, if you don't mind, to come to the feast? And now, several hundred excited people, sometime on Friday, make their way into Jerusalem. They've waved goodbye to Jesus as he made his way. Uh, as you're climbing up, there's a road that goes off to the south of Bethany, and he watched, and they knew the people traveling know that he's going off. That's a, he's, he's going to, everybody is concerned on Friday where they're going to be on, on, on Sabbath. So they watch as they go down there. They go into the city, and they're burying these two all-important messages. Number one, he is coming. We know he's coming. You're all excited. He is coming because we've been with him. But number two, he'll be here Sunday morning. How do we know that? Because he stopped in Bethany. Bethany is just outside the Sabbath zone, that, uh, that radius of about a mile and two-fifths from the center of the city. And, and actually, Bethany is a good bit outside the Sabbath zone, about three-quarters of a mile or half a mile. But nonetheless, people would realize that he, having stopped in Bethany with his disciples, he won't be able to come into Jerusalem on the Sabbath. It's, he's outside the Sabbath zone. Again, I'm going to say the Sabbath zone, wherever you are, when the sun goes down on Friday, you draw that, that whatever it is, say about a mile and two-fifths, you draw that radius, and you can move about freely within that radius, but you can't leave it. And if you're outside, you can't come in. And because Bethany is outside that Sabbath zone, everybody in that crowd knows that he won't be in on Saturday, and you don't make that kind of trip after sundown in that culture, and so he'll be here Sunday morning. And as I said last time, I think what happened without any deliberate concert or any social media contacts, the word began to spread like wildfire through that, that town, which is already a Twitter with the question, is he coming? And uh, one by one, families determined, you know what, uh, maybe I, I know that, again, if you're one of those people who have arrived, you're there in Jerusalem now, and uh, you're saying to yourself, our, our leaders, the rabbis, insist that Jesus is an imposter, that this Nazarene is doing these miracles by the power of Beelzebub, but good heavens, I know people who have been healed, for heaven's sakes. I'm sick of Rome. There's a guy walking around town by the name of Lazarus who was in a tomb for four days, and now he's, he's, he's walking about. Uh, I know that they insist this man is an imposter, but, but I'm sick of Rome. It could be, why not get up early on Sunday morning? There's only one road coming in from Bethany and, and, and welcome him. And so now we come to the story before us. And uh, this is a sort of a graphic of that uh, friend uh, sent this to me, made this graphic of that idea of the Sabbath zone. So again, uh, you can see Bethany over here is well outside the Sabbath zone. But I want to say again that we had, over the earlier lessons, we had delivered this question. Here's the promise. You won't see me until you welcome me as king. How is that going to happen? Jesus raises Lazarus. Now the city is a Twitter. He's a uh, fugitive. He's hiding in Ephraim. Now he takes this careful route. He makes his way, stops on Friday, and uh, allows this, these people to go in and alert the city. And I'm going to go back in John chapter 12 and verse 12. We have that kind of enigmatic, though I don't think it's all that enigmatic. I think it's explained by what we're talking about here. But you have the phrase, which is taken by any many who are, <clears throat> I'm sorry, you have a statement which is taken by many as enigmatic when John says, John 12 and verse 12, introducing the drama that's before us, the triumphal entry. And John says, when the people heard that Jesus was, had come to Jerusalem. So somehow the word got out, and I think it is by means of the, uh, of the uh, strategy which Jesus used. So now, it is in fact Sunday morning, and uh, Jesus, you know this story. I'm going to come back to it in just a moment. Jesus dispatches his disciples, and fetch a, they fetch a colt, a donkey, and he rides that donkey into Jerusalem and the whole city erupts in happy welcome. I want to come back to it, but I have to talk about one other thing, first of all, and that is this, that uh, there is an event which happens on Saturday night, 
And I've given you uh, Matthew, Mark, and John all record this event. It's a blessed but hugely important event. And what happens is this, that, that on Saturday night, now, there's some confusion, and it's legitimate confusion. I, I, I think I've got it figured out, and I'm going to share it with you on another time. But there is some confusion as to precisely when this event occurred. When this, what we're talking about is the feast at the home of Simon the leper, which celebrates Jesus, and at which Mary anoints Jesus. And then Mary gets rebuked for anointing Jesus, and Jesus rebukes those who have rebuked Mary. Did you get all that? So you're familiar with this, this marvelous, marvelous event. And it really is important to the unfolding of this week, but its importance shows up on Tuesday night. So I'm going to return to this discussion on Tuesday night, but for now, that is as to how we can know on what night the feast and the anointing occurred and also how it fits into the unfolding drama. But for now, let's just talk about the event. And here, uh, I'm convinced, and I think John is quite explicit, that it happened on Saturday night. Now, as a matter of fact, well, I'm, to, to save myself time, I'm going to just, uh, uh, let me just talk to you, talk you through this, this, this event. Jesus arrived six days before the Passover in Bethany. I don't think that the people in Bethany who had learned to love Jesus because just a few weeks ago, he had called from the tomb while most of us watched our friend Lazarus. And before he emerged from that tomb, we had to endure the death stench. And so there's no doubt that he was genuinely dead. So this is a little village that much loves Jesus. And the point is simply this, that Jesus arrives six days before the Passover, that's Friday. And uh, of course, Saturday would be a quiet day. Now, as the sun goes down on Friday, the Jewish people welcome in. Now, you're perhaps familiar with this, if, if nowhere else, uh, if, if you've watched the opening scenes of Fiddler on the Roof. And uh, if you don't know Fiddler on the Roof well, parts of it by heart, well, shame on you, get to work. But it's a wonderful movie and it really does give you a glimpse into a lot of Jewish culture in so many different ways. But as the story begins, Tevye's coming home and his horse is lame and the girls are scurrying to put on their Sabbath best and so on. But then finally they, they gather in the, in the kitchen with some guests and, uh, and, uh, and, and the mother welcomes in the Sabbath. She lights the candles and puts her shawl on and says the blessing and so on. And that's bringing in the Sabbath. And then you keep the Sabbath throughout the day. But as the sun goes down on Saturday night, there is the going out of the Sabbath. Now, there is no formal ceremony. But you have to remember that for Jewish people, the weekend, what we think of the weekend is, is, the, is Friday and Saturday. Actually, half Friday and all of Saturday. And on Sunday, they get up and go back to work. So they enjoy relaxing and, 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 and spending time together So on Saturday night. So with the going out of the Sabbath, and this is kind of fun to watch when you're in Israel, when we have time and our schedule allows and our energy allows, sometimes on Saturday night after the quiet, quiet, almost spooky quiet of the city all day on Saturday, you can go up to, and it's best to get out of the old city and up to Ben Yehuda Street or somewhere where there's, uh, it's pretty thoroughly Jewish. And what will happen is, as the sun goes down, pretty soon you'll see people coming and start to walk around, and then you'll watch as the lights come on in the shops, and pretty soon the stores will be open, and the restaurants will be open, and then the, mus the, the street musicians will come out, and, and everybody will be out having ice cream and walking and so on. That's the going out of the Sabbath. Well, in other words, you, 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 I think that's exactly what happens. Jesus comes to Bethany on Friday. Now, he quickly, that he and his disciples would have joined there in the house of Lazarus and kept the Sabbath quietly and so on. But as people are keeping the Sabbath, and you, you, can, you can visit and so on, the, the word would get out. Jesus is in town, the Nazarene, this one whom we cherish. So he's back. We didn't see this coming. We should have a feast. And so with the going out of the feast, they gather at the home of a, of a man named Simon the leper. Interestingly enough, Simon the leper, and I always say, I wonder if maybe, if maybe there wasn't, here's another man. I mean, when you get an invitation 
for a little bit of a meal and a soiree from Simon the leper, are you inclined to attend? Probably not, I always say, and this is probably really, really bad little boy humor, but maybe they're serving finger food. You might not, okay, leave that alone. But point is, I shouldn't have said that. But, but the point is that uh, he evidently is healed. And maybe he, as well as other, I mean, he's another guy who really has a reason. I'm talking about Simon the leper. But however you take that, the word gets out and they gather for, the, for just a feast honoring Jesus. And at that feast, and as I've said to you before, I think there are, there are two commodities of life which you and I entirely take for granted, which are, which are very, very rare, precious, expensive in the ancient world. And uh, when they enter the record, it, it, you ought to take note of that. And those two commodities are color and scent. Deep, bright colors and beautiful aromas are, they're, they're very expensive. And that's the backdrop to this story where Mary comes and, and, and this is such a winsome and delightful story. And Mary, the sister of Lazarus comes and, and I want you to imagine now, Lazarus is, I'm sorry, the home of Simon where they've gathered is undoubtedly a, a large home and there would have been, uh, he would have had a courtyard. The home was always built around a courtyard. Most of the living was done in the courtyard. So most of the guests perhaps arranged in the courtyard and, and, and nearby and, and, and clusters of people and many of them gathering around Jesus. But now Mary comes and I picture her just sort of working through the crowd and getting up behind Jesus. And you know, when she took that vial of very expensive oil and just popped the top, just cut away the wax seal and, and pulled out that cork that quick, everybody I'm guessing within 10 or 20 feet would have stopped what they were doing and would have gone, wow. What is that? Do you, do you smell that? I've never smelt anything like that. And they would have expected that maybe she would just take a little dab of it and, and it, would, it would have been so impressive and such an act of love and fraternity and kindness just to refresh him with just a little dab of that oil, that very, very expensive oil. But no, she begins to slosh it on his head. And then, and then as the text says, she, she washes, she, she just anoints him fully with that oil. And now is that everybody, all throughout the, the neighborhood almost, as that smell began to drift, people would have stopped what they were doing and saying and coming. And I'm telling you, I think if you or I had been there that day, we too would have said, Mary, do you know what you're doing? And she does. And of course, Jesus, she, she, everybody, the disciples, Matthew says, Mark says, everybody's standing around. John says, of course, that it was Judas. And we're going to come back to that as well. But what I want you to see is everybody, everybody there. And I think it would have been just a natural, almost undeniable reaction to say, what are you doing? Are you thinking? And then Jesus, and I don't think there's any scolding. I don't think there's any anger. I, I, I think Jesus would have realized that your, your concern is, 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 is reasonable. But I picture Jesus saying, no, no, let her alone. She's done this against the day of my burial. Folks, we've mentioned before that just about seven months before Jesus' passion, before this time right now, Jesus had begun telling his disciples that he was going to die. And he told again and again, he said it. He said it to everybody. You remember the, the angel who encountered Mary at the tomb, at the empty tomb, said he's gone into, he, he has returned from the dead just as he told you. So he had told everybody, I'm going to die, and on the third day, I'm going to rise again. But every evidence, both in the explicit reaction of the disciples and in the broader narrative, every evidence is they didn't get it. They refused to listen. The idea of Jesus dying was so offensive to them, of their Messiah dying. And folks, again, I shouldn't stop here, but understand, and, and we've let this we've let these two ideas distance themselves inappropriately. And, and what I'm talking about is when the king comes, he brings a kingdom. And that kingdom is eternal. All throughout the Old Testament, that kingdom is forever and ever. And you're saying, wait a minute, I thought the, year, the, the, the kingdom was a thousand years. No, that's, that's in Revelation 20, to be sure there is going to be an eternal, there, there's going to be a thousand year stage of the eternal kingdom. But the kingdom is eternal. And here comes Messiah, who is going to offer you that kingdom, and that kingdom is eternal. Where is dying in that? So again, it was, it was a real problem. Now again, we understand that he's going to be rejected, that he was going to come again, 
and then the eternal kingdom will be established, first of all, with a thousand years uh, uh, period. But I'm just saying that here's my point. I lost it. Jesus had said explicitly again and again that he was going to die. But the only person in the record that I can find who was willing to listen and who was willing to believe and bow the knee, embrace the horrible thought that the Messiah is going to die. The only person in the record is this lovely woman, Mary. And I think it's for that reason that Jesus says, leave her alone. She's anticipated my burial. And because of this, as long as this story is told, this woman's going to be honored. And we are fulfilling Jesus' prophecy as we talk about it now. So at any rate, that happens on Saturday night. But now I want to return to the, uh, the PowerPoint and walk you through the events of, and, and again, you know what I'm going to do? First of all, I'm going to share, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm worried about the mechanics of this, but let me take you to the scriptures themselves. And I think it's, it's certainly worthwhile to read through the, now I'm going to read to you the first account, that is Matthew's account. And, uh, and then we'll just highlight in some of the others. But now let me go back, and I'd like to at least set the scene as much as we have in our, in our study, and, and remind you that Jesus has carefully strategized to alert the city to his coming. It's Passover. It's Sunday morning. An excited city already abuzz with a question as to whether or not Jesus was going to come. <clears throat> they have been alerted to the fact that he is coming. John 12 and verse 12. I think the way Jesus alerted them was that trip that we talked about, but however you want, this city erupts in happy welcome. And here is Matthew's record of it. Now, when they drew near Jerusalem, they came to Beth Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, and Jesus sent two disciples. Now, they've left, and we know from uh, Bethany, but uh, just up the hill, they're coming up the back sides, a steep hill coming up the back side of the Mount of Olives or the eastern slope. And just, just a little bit west and up the hill from Bethany is Beth Bethphage. And so he had said to them, go into the village opposite. You'll immediately, you'll find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, the Lord has need of them. And immediately he will send them. All was done that it might be fulfilled. Well, before I read that verse, let me just say, and folks, this is by my lights. And so I'm going to share it with you, and I'm uh, please just take it as one, one voice. I believe that Jesus had set this up. I think Jesus, uh, perhaps during the, the Passover, had talked to one of the servants of, uh, of uh, Lazarus and said, I, I need a donkey. And uh, do you know where somebody right up the hill here has one? Well, would you ask him if I could borrow it? And so now they've been alerted that he's going to use it. Now, you can take this as omniscience. Please understand, I am not questioning whether or not Jesus, number one, was God very God, or number two, whether he was in intrinsic ontological possession of all the attributes of deity, including omniscience. But as I have argued before, I think the record is quite plain that in some way that ultimately transcends our ability to even understand or imagine Jesus had voluntarily surrendered the independent exercise of those divine attributes, and it was only as the Spirit of God enabled him that he knew supernaturally. Maybe here. Maybe here. Help yourself. I just think uh, there's so much about it which, which is otherworldly, and, and, and it's a little bit, if you don't mind, Clark Kentish to imagine Jesus... And why would those people so quickly acquiesce? I think it makes better sense. And I think this is the way Jesus lived his life. He had to live his life. This is one of the most important dynamics of this is I think it, I want to, I'm, I, I'm, I'm so eager to, to at least challenge you with this thought that Jesus lived a life so desperately more like ours. And he couldn't just say, I need a donkey bird. And now again, I'm being a little flip there and I shouldn't, but, but I, I, it, I that's not the way we live our lives. 
did Jesus on occasion demonstrate superhuman knowledge? Absolutely. Did Peter demonstrate superhuman knowledge with regard to Ananias and Sapphira? Yes. Do we assume that Peter lived his entire life that way? No. Well, I don't think we should here, and I think the evidence is clearly that Jesus did not. So I got lost in that. The point is, however you like it, Jesus sends for the colt, and I'll tell you why it's really important, but he goes on to say, Matthew does, all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet. This is Zechariah saying, tell the daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming to you lowly and sitting on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. So the disciples went, Jesus commanded them, they brought the donkey, laid their clothes on them and set him on them. And watch this, a very great multitude spread their clothes on the road. Time out, folks. Second Kings chapter 10, I believe it is, Jehu, when a son of a prophet is sent by Elisha to anoint Jehu, the next king of the northern kingdom, as soon as Jehu's soldiers hear about it, they throw their garments down uh, for him to walk on. Why? Because he's, they, they're acknowledging that he is king. This is how in this culture you acknowledge a king. You're really submitting yourself to him. You're, 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 you're putting yourself under his feet, as it were. You're swearing allegiance to him. But the point is, it's a multitude, and they are welcoming him as king individually, individually, taking off their outer garment and throwing it on the road. Others cut down branches from the trees, spread them on the road, and the multitudes, hear that, who went before, there was a huge crowd before, and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Psalm 118, every one of the four gospels makes the point that they began to sing uh, parts of Psalm 118 as Jesus uh, rode into the city. That is the Psalm of Messianic Inauguration. And then it says, when he had come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, who is this? And the multitude said, no, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth of Galilee. Now, there, there, there's some confusion in that, and we'll sort that out, but he is welcomed as king. Now, let me take you quickly and just highlight something. Here is Mark's telling of the same story, and it's very, very similar. Uh, but notice he also says, down here in verse 8, they spread their clothes on the, on the road. Uh, but notice they too, in verses in, in the end of verse 9 there, they were crying, Hosanna in the Greek, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And notice this too in the yellow, only Mark gives us this, it's interesting, Jesus went into Jerusalem and into the temple, and when he had looked around at all things as the hour was already late, he went out to Bethany. So he made his way all the way into the temple, and I'll explain that route in just a moment. Luke very, very similar. Uh, the, he does uh, mention once again there in verse 37, I'm in Luke 19, that the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works, singing, blessed is the king who comes. And of course, it goes on to say this, he records, there are two points that Luke makes here that are very important. Number one, he mentions here in this portion in verse 40, that after some of Jesus' detractors had said, make your disciples stop. He said the stones would immediately cry out. And the reason for that is because in point of fact, this is the day which the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. The stones would cry out. But then Jesus goes on to say, and this is important, if you had known, even you, especially in this your day. So in some sense, this day, now it could be taken generically, just in the old day, but this is special. But I think the emphasis on this, your day, what makes for your peace. But he goes on to say that, no, they, they it's been hidden from their eyes by reason of their disobedience, their un, unbelief. And therefore, he says in verse 43, and this is where Jesus prophesies 70 AD. when he says, the days will come when your enemies will build an embankment, they'll surround. And of course, this is Titus Vespasian, AD 70. Uh, and not one stone will be left upon another. How I'd like to talk to you about that. That came to pass stunningly, literally. But uh, uh, Luke tells us that story. And then finally, John gives us in, uh, in John 12, again, he says, uh, the next day when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, 
they took branches, they went out to meet him, they began to sing the Psalms and so on, the Psalm 118. It is interesting here in verse 16 in the yellow, John has a comment that uh, well, nobody else does, where he says his disciples didn't understand these things at first. And I think he means as they happened. But when Jesus was glorified after the resurrection, then they remembered that these things were written. It's, it's really stunning how, how, I don't know another word, clueless they are. Well, let me leave it at that. Uh, th that's the biblical story. Let me take you to a map which I can use to perhaps trace. I, I just think it might be helpful to, uh, uh, here is a, a, a map. It's a, it's a good hand-drawn, I mean, not hand-drawn for heaven's sakes, but it's a, it's a commonly used map. And I'm going to try and write on this because, again, over here on the eastern side of the city, is, of course, the Mount of Olives. And on the back side of the Mount of Olives is a little village called Bethany. And Jesus has stopped there on Friday and kept the Sabbath and then kept the, uh, enjoyed that feast and that unspeakable kindness of Mary and so on. But now it's Friday morning. I'm sorry, it's Saturday. It's Sunday. Here I am. What time is it? So it's Sunday morning, and this is the route that Jesus would have taken. Now listen, uh, he is on the east side of the city. The city is walled, and there is no gate accessible to pedestrians. There's some question about this. Some make reference to a sheep gate uh, to the north of the Temple Mount, but he wouldn't have gone in that gate. And, uh, and really, the, the, the gate which he is going to have to use is way down here at the southern end of the city. It's called the Dung Gate, and because the gate's names usually are a function of where they take you, and there was some sort of a garbage dung dump probably at the confluence of the three valleys, the central and the in Ohm and the on the eastern side of the city, uh, but uh, and the Cadrone Valley, but at any rate, he would have made his way over the Mount of Olives and then down the Kidron Valley to find this gate. Now, once he went in the gate, he would be at the Pool of Siloam right here. But, and this is fascinating because it's been rather recently discovered, there was a, a, a huge, what I call a ceremonial walkway. It is even now being dug out up to the north. And it was in, in, in Israel. It's a big deal. They're making, and it is. It's a wonderful, wonderful thing. They're working hard to dig out the northern portion of this, uh, the part that runs right along, uh, right up to the Temple Mount. But at any rate, it was a, and evidently, and you can stand on this pavement from Jesus' day. You can stand on the pavement that Jesus walked up because there was a walkway on either side of, of a drainage ditch, and the walkway went right up here. Now, this is the temple, of course, and the main entrance to the temple was always on the south. And that's simply because, remember, the city of David is right here. This is David's city, and that's all he ever possessed. But then he bought a threshing floor to the north, and his son Solomon built the temple to the north, but the city was to the south. So, so the main entrance was from the south, and as Herod reconstructed Zerubbabel's second temple, he honored that, and so there were two gates. They were called the Holda Gates, and they are here on the south. They're subterranean. You walk in, and then up a ramp and up some steps in a, in a uh, torch-lit walkway, and you emerge on the Temple Mount up here. Now, Mark tells us that Jesus went all the way in and actually stepped into the temple. Now, he had come, and this is so important, he had come to present himself to the multitudes. This is the most dramatic and important moment or a, a presentation in all of Jesus' life. And so he's going to go where the multitudes are. And Herod had reconstructed this whole eastern side of the city. He reconstructed much of the city, but this whole eastern side was designed for crowd control. Because it's interesting, and this is important. On the one hand, Herod had built, had reconstructed Zerubbabel's humble temple that they had built and, and, and dedicated back in 516, but uh, Herod had rebuilt that temple, and uh, you know, the rabbis say that, uh, all right, there are only two temples, but there are two stages to the second temple, Zerubbabel and Herod, 
And the rabbis like to say that Herod's temple was as much more beautiful than Solomon's as Solomon's was more beautiful than Zerubbabel's. And it, it, it was a magnificent structure. But the point is that he had built it for crowd control because he, he, he knew that at, at the feast and especially at Passover, the only feast where you had to have a sacrifice and you had to eat it in the precincts of the temple, he knew that literally hundreds and hundreds of thousands of Jews would come up. And the point is, he wanted that to happen because this was, I believe, his greatest cash cow. Herod the Great was a genius. He had been given control of that eastern, uh, that is the eastern flank of the Roman Empire, and it was such an important uh, travel route that he was able to tax that and get fabulously rich. And then later on, he had uh, uh, built a harbor and captured the sp spice trade route. But the biggest cash cow he had ever come up with is this, is this temple. So, of course, not only the people who came, but the people all over the world who willingly played two days wages, all the Jews who would send their, their, their two-day temple tax and so on. So the point is, he wanted those huge crowds, but he had to somehow make room for those crowds. And so he had built this walkway, this beautiful walkway. And of course, it began with the Pool of Siloam, which was a mikvah. And it's my personal opinion, do what you want with this, but I, 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 it makes all the sense in the world that Jesus would have visited that mikvah. You really, according to our, the literature, you couldn't get into the temple without the token that showed you it had been the mikvah. And the mikvah was, was it, it really, the mikvah was about ritual purification. And uh, before you approach God, that, that, and clearly there are 60 mikvah within, within a stone's throw distance of the temple and so on. So however you like that, Jesus makes his way with his disciples. He gets on that donkey, rides over the hill, down the Kedron Valley, in the Dung Gate, and then makes his way up. And I think it's fair to say that that pretty well took the day. By the time he got, I mean, that's what Mark says, by the time he made his way with all of the acclaim and the rejoicing and perhaps stopping along the way and so on, uh, by the time he got up, it was already late in the day. And he just went into the temple, looked around, he would have gone in the gate here, which is the access gate. And then he would have come out the gate on the left side, the egress gate. And, uh, and then I think probably got back on the donkey and made his way back over the hill. That is the day. Now, it, I'm going to say again, it was a, uh, uh, it, 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 the city exploded in happy welcome. And it's timely to stop very quickly, and ask this question. Now, folks, as I say to you, this is a real drama. And what I mean by that is, it's, it's a drama. We need to understand it as a drama. It begins on this day when Jesus presents himself, having carefully orchestrated the event and so on by preparing the city. But I'm gonna go back to it. These are my two emphases. It is a drama. Follow the story, but it's a real drama. It's a historical drama. And there's a question that arises here, and I'm going to take just two or three minutes to talk about it. And uh, I, I, I'd invite you to spend some time with it yourself. But there is a question which fairly jumps off the page. And frankly, it, it confuses me a bit that it is so little addressed. Hardly anybody asks the question, how did Jesus get away with this? Now, backdrop. Rome is a fairly newly minted empire. There are scores of dominions and kingdoms and so on, which in the last century or so, they can remember what it was like to be in charge of their own affairs, to be minting their own coins and collecting their own taxes and having their own standing armies. But they've been absorbed or, 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 or overtaken or conquered uh, and somehow they are now under the heel of Rome, and they, they don't like it. And, and my point is simply this, that Rome had to constantly deal with sedition, specifically pretender kings. And, and, and Rome would not tolerate any sort of seditious activity. She would put it down at, with the violence and, 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 and urge. I mean, she would be so, she wanted to put it down immediately. And, and so my point is, Rome is 
fairly paranoid about sedition, rebellion, pretender kings, the local royal family that used to run things. And now the, they, they get the idea that the Roman army is looking the other way. It's not very strong right here. And they put together seditious activity. Rome won't put up with it. They're absolutely paranoid and good reason. Somebody said, just because you're paranoid doesn't mean nobody's chasing you. And the fact is they had good reason to be paranoid, but the place in their entire empire where it happened more often than anything else was Judea. It had happened a huge one in 6 AD. It took them three years to put it down. And so they were constantly on the alert. And the one day, and I'll tell you something else, the one place in their empire probably, I don't know about that, but one of the places in their empire where it was most difficult to put down sedition was Israel. But I tell people all the time that Israel is like one big paintball arcade, and Rome was really good at just massive, overwhelming flanks, phalanx uh, 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 attack and so on. But the fact is that it didn't work in Israel. So it would take them so long to put it down. And, and, and the one time of the year when they, was, they were most nervous was Passover, because there are, all the Jews are thinking about sedition. I mean, they're remembering when God delivered them from a Roman overlord. I'm sorry, from a Gentile overlord, which at that time was Egypt, today is Rome. And the one city, in the, the one uh, city that, that they have the most concern is Jerusalem. So here's my point. Rome is paranoid about sedition. They are especially sensitive to Israel. The one day of the year that they're most concerned and on highest alert is Passover. And yet Jesus rides into town and is welcomed as king, and nobody does anything about it. Now, I think we've already answered that question. But let me just say very quickly that I have run across, and I'm not going to, well, I have run across what I regard as really insufficient and really ignoble answers. Answers such as that, well, you know, probably the disciples who wrote this, we were all excited, but they saw these people, but the people were just dancing because it was Passover. And they heard people saying, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. But maybe that was just a, you say that about Joseph or Andrew, whoever came along. Hey, how you doing, Isaac? Blessed are you. And, and they'll say that, no, no. And, and, and they'll say that maybe this was just a little, little group of people. And let me tell you something. That's what the Romans were looking for. And if there was just a little group of people, they had, they had soldiers disguised as peasants just looking for any sort of seditious activity. So I go back to it. How? Did Jesus get away with it the same way he got away? He protected himself again and again throughout his ministry. And that is he was surrounded by multitudes. And the explanation as to how the, Jesus got away with it is the Bible's explanation. Because Matthew says the whole city was moved with his coming. Folks, neither his Jewish nor his Roman enemies can arrest the whole city. That's what you got to understand. He got away with it because he had been so clever as to alert the city and make sure that when he entered the city, it would erupt in this happy welcome and thus his enemy's hands would be tied. Now, listen, I got to be done. I'm late. I will go back real quickly and see if this will work for us to the, uh, uh, wait, before I do that, to the, uh, I'm going to go back to the PowerPoint because it's important to understand that, that, that there are three uh, lines of Old Testament prophetic promise which come together on, on this day. And uh, let me go to the screen. So they are, in the first place, three lines of uh, specific Old Testament prophecy. The first one I like to say is the manner of Messiah's coming, and that is Zechariah nine nine. We read it before. Rejo well, we read it in uh, in in John. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion! Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem! Your King is coming to you, just and having salvation. I'd love to talk about that, but he goes on to say, lowly and riding on a donkey. Now, folks, just real quickly, this is more startling than you might think, simply because this is not how a king rides into his capital city. When the king rides in in any sort of ceremonial entry, there's going to be uh, all sorts of paraphernalia. There are going to be the accoutrements of royalty. There are going to be uh, banners and military presence and trumpets and so on. None of that. None of that. And yet, he's accepted. He's welcomed as a king. He's greeted as a king. Everything that they're doing. 
So it's amazing that a king enters in lowly fashion, and yet they receive him as a king. Now, one other thing. I know that almost everybody will say that basically the donkey is the lowly part, that it's appositional lowly, yeah, even riding on a donkey. I don't think so. I think because in antiquity, kings rode on donkeys. The donkey was a royal steed. I've seen various explanations. The one I like the best is that uh, uh, if you're on a, a stallion, a mighty war horse, it would seem that you're not, you don't have everything under control, but under, if, you know, Everything must be peaceful if you're on a donkey, however you like that. The donkey, I think, is the one sort of a, a, a claim to deity. He gets on a donkey because that's how kings ride. But there would have been other people on donkeys as well. But he, he rides in and, and he's humble. There are no none of the accoutrements of, of a royal entrance. But he is, uh, I think he is perhaps quietly identifying himself as a king by getting on a donkey, but that's the first line of prophecy. Now the second one, and I'm going to be a little over time. I kind of warned you that I might go just a little long, but I'm going to be done very, very quickly, uh, is the moment of Messiah's coming. And this is Daniel 9. Now listen, this is a, a, a Daniel 9, 24 to 27 is one of the most important uh, chronological pro, uh, 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 promises in the Old Testament. It is really the basis of all eschatological, if we're going to figure out a cons the end time drama, it's going to be, we're going to start with this, if we're going to take the Bible literally. But in it, what it says in verse 24 is this, that from the going forth of a command, and that command was given in 444 BC, I believe, again, there are a lot of discussion about this, and we can talk about this in one of our, our uh, you know, sidebar sessions, perhaps, but uh, there was a, a decree that was given to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. That's the decree to Nehemiah 444 BC. But it goes on to say, and you got to work your way through the, the, the kind of, you got to parse the words and, and work through the verbiage. But what it says is that from the going forth of a command on to Messiah the Prince will be 483 years, or more specifically, 69 cycles of seven years. And I take those years for reasons that are quite common and though, though there's a lot of debate about it to be 360 day years and when you do the arithmetic and start out on we we can recover nissan 1 444 as the day when that decree was given and if you start there and count forward those 300 uh those uh the, the precise number of years uh uh now i lost the number seven times 70 is 490 483 years that is 69 cycles of seven years, each year being 360 days long, 173,880 days. And it brings you out a lot of discussion about this. I wouldn't get ugly about this. I tell people I believe this with two or three fibers of my being, if you get my drift. But what I'm saying is that it's, it's very possible to take this as, as teaching that here is a chart which, which gives it to you. But but from Nissan 1, 444, or March 4th, 444, on to uh, would have been March 29th, 33, is exactly that number of years. And it is interesting to me that the psalmist had said, this is the day which the Lord has made. And Jesus wept and said, only if you knew what belonged to you on this your day. And I think very possibly the very moment of Messiah's uh, uh coming had been prophesied. But let me say this. Let me say this. If, if it doesn't work in your mind to make it the very day, and, and, and I, I think that we, it, it, it would have been harder for the people of that day to figure that out than it is for us today because we have some additional information in, in Revelation 12 and so on. But on the other hand, there is absolutely no doubt that you have a, cl a, a clock that starts ticking 400, I'm sorry, in uh, 444 BC, and uh, it's it's about to go off. So I, I think it's fair to say that that with regard to this entire uh, era in which Jesus lived, there was this awareness that Messiah was soon to appear. I think it can get a little closer, but leave it alone. But here's the big one, and that is that the meaning of Messiah's coming, because in that Psalm 118 which God gave Israel to teach them how to receive their Messiah. They were taught to cry out, save 
now. Now, let me say this very quickly. The messianic hope is first born, if you don't mind, in the hearts of men, of a man and a woman, in Genesis chapter 3. And immediately after man had rebelled, God set out to redeem. And he gave a remarkable promise. And that promise was that he, God, was going to raise up one from the seed of woman who would have the power to crush the skull, to render entirely defeated and destroyed the enemy who had brought this curse upon humanity, upon Adam and Eve. Now, that messianic hope grows considerably throughout the Old Testament. And we learn a lot more about what the Messiah is going to do and who he's going to be and from what seed he's going to come. But you never, ever grow beyond that seminal promise. Now, I know the promise has to do with the seed, but I mean, it is itself a seed out of which everything else grows. And so fundamental to everything about the messianic hope is this. He and he alone will deliver us from sin. Now, here's a problem. As time went by, in the Old Testament, God raised up a people called Israel, and, and, and God made promises to them, and, and God allowed them to fall under the heel of Gentile dominion, and God promised them that that same Messiah was going to deliver them also from Gentile power, specifically, in this case, from Rome. And that's, that's legitimate. It's real. I know there's a whole school of, 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 of theological thought that says it's not legitimate, but that is that God decided against that. But, but no, but here's the point. Yes, Messiah will have, will deliver his people from subjugation, but more fundamental, more basic, more intrinsic to the whole messianic hope is this. Messiah is your savior from sin. So let me conclude with that because I want to go back to the, I have to do it in a different order. Uh, I want to go back to the uh, uh, PowerPoint just quickly and make this point. I want to go back to the days of the week. Sorry for the fiddling around here just a little bit. But uh, now I've made a mess. Let me, uh, first of all, take you back to the PowerPoint. I know I'm driving you nuts out there. You know what? I will just take you. I'm in such trouble here. Hold on. All right terribly clumsy way to conclude here, but I'm just going to conclude uh, by reminding you that this is our outline, that the days of the week, Sunday is a day of messianic presentation. Now, Monday and Tuesday, we will regard as days of messianic proclamation. I'll, I'll come back to that later on, but I want to conclude with two simple notes. I'm late. First of all, the story before us, the story that we've contemplated, the story of this marvelous, marvelous day of triumphal entry, as the Christian world has learned to call it this time, when Jesus most dramatically offers himself, makes the presentation of himself as their long-awaited Messiah, this day when the city in such happy welcome erupted excitedly and went out to throw down their garments and sing the Hosanna Psalms. And by the way, don't miss this. All those weeks ago, Jesus had said, you're not going to see me until you cry out, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The Gospels are explicit as he rode into the city. The city cried out, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. You'd have said, oh man, I don't think that's going to happen. Jesus carefully contrived to make it happen. But that drama, that scene, rather forces another question on our mind. And that question simply is this. Given Sunday... Why Friday? Given the fact that on Sunday the city welcomed him with such seemingly, you know, other than the angry Jewish leaders and perhaps the frightened Roman leaders, the city itself exploded in happy welcome. Given that, why on Friday is the same city crying out 
crucify him. We will not have this man to reign over us. Now listen, we're going to explore that in the next two days. But I'd, I'd, I'd invite you to ponder it, be thinking about it. It's an important question given Sunday, why Friday? But having said that, let me just close with this, that Sunday was above all things a day of messianic presentation. On that day, Jesus rode into the city and deliberately, lovingly, and legitimately offered himself as the long-awaited Savior from the curse of sin and death. Today, he makes that same offer. And it's so important to understand that God had, point, had, had, had written a psalm, had caused a psalm to be written to give them careful instructions as to how to receive their Messiah. And he taught them cry out, save now, ho shana, be our savior. Folks, I trust that you have acknowledged him as savior, that you have welcomed in him genuinely into your heart. Because in point of fact, that offer is legitimate. He is legitimate to offer himself as the savior of Israel, as the savior of all men. And you know what else? He alone is legitimate to make that offer. So as you contemplate Sunday, the day of the triumphal entry, the day of messianic presentation, understand that that is the offer he is making. And the offer is just as important, just as valid, just as blessed today. Thank you for being with me. And again, our plan is to gather together at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning and contemplate the huge leap. Let me just tell you this. I have often told people that if you came to me with one free ride on your newly invented time machine, I think I dial up Monday and Tuesday. It, they are stunning days. And we'll go to our discussion of that tomorrow. Lord bless.